A Boy at Shiloh, read by Captain Charles Morton, U.S. Army, October 6, 1897. The Battle of Shiloh was not only the first great battle in the late Great War, but one of the greatest in our history, and it stands second to none in modern history for its fierceness and persistent determination. It was fought without generals, and it may be said almost without soldiers. It was armed Americans against Americans, terribly in earnest and full of fight, infuriated by a hatred that had grown out of 50 years of bitter political strife that was besettled by a physical contest with arms. Both sides believed that upon the turn of this battle, in great measure hung the general final result, and who today can doubt that there would have been a more speedy termination of the war on much different terms had our army met on this occasion total defeat, or had its victory been promptly and vigorously followed up? Though the passion and hatred that then obtained gradually and before the end of the war almost entirely disappeared, the battle has been fought over and over again since, and not always entirely dispassionate and harmless ink. Indeed, it has been written up from so many different standpoints that it seems there is nothing left untold and in such masterly ways that any account by me would prove weak and insipid. Yet there are a few facts relating to the battle that came under my personal observation, or to my knowledge at the time, that have been barely touched upon, or not at all, in any of the numerous descriptions I have read. They seem to me all important facts for truthful history and a better understanding of the battle. The proper limits of a paper to be read here preclude the possibility, or are inclined to give a full account of the battle, so taking for granted that all of you are familiar with the general features of the engagement, I confine myself to the points on which history is silent. I prefer to do this in a simple narrative of some of my own experience immediately preceding and during the engagement, and I desire it to be understood that I am not fully persuaded that I have fought that great battle all alone on our side, nor that I can convince you now that it is to be greatly regretted that I was not in supreme command at the time, and I further trust that I will be exempt from any accusation of an egotistical desire to parade my own personal prowess in the battle when I tell you frankly in advance that the most prominent feature of my conduct was the tall running I did. And if the pronouns I and we seem conspicuous, let it be understood that it is merely for convenience of brief expression. I further take for granted that your familiarity with the battle with what I have to say renders unnecessary any maps or diagrams or tiresome statistics that you will not remember. It is necessary to commence with some preliminary details. I was a private in Company I, 25th Missouri Volunteer Infantry, it was organized immediately after the fall of Fort Sumter as a home guard company to protect Union men from oppression by secessionists and guarded for several months the Hannibal and St. Joseph Railroad. It was composed of Union men and boys of the southern part of Davis and northern part of Caldwell counties of the state mentioned and became a part of the 13th Missouri Infantry on the 25th of July, 1861, the number of the regiment being subsequently changed. My captain was George K. Donnelly, a practicing physician of Kidder, Missouri, he was a man of marked intelligence, great determination and energy, and a thorough practical soldier, having served many years in the 4th U.S. Artillery, which service included the campaign from Veracruz to the fall of the city of Mexico, than which there is none more daring, brilliant, and successful recorded in history. He carried the scars of five or six gunshot wounds and of a bayonet received on the then greatest day field day of our army, the four sweeping victories at Contreras, Churubusco, San Antonio, and the Bridgehead. These wounds took him from the service by resignation soon after the Battle of Shiloh. He had filled every non-commissioned grade in the regular regiment, besides being a drummer and hospital steward, and he was the life and spirit in the organization and discipline of our own. The colonel was Everett Peabody, a strikingly handsome man of massive build and commanding presence. A native of Massachusetts, a graduate from Harvard and a civil engineer by profession, in which he had risen to considerable prominence. Our major was James E. Powell, a captain of the 1st U.S. Infantry, a modest, cool-headed, capable, brave officer, who endeared himself to the hearts of all during the few days he was with us. I ended the service with the company by being rated a musician, and that although I was not then, and have never been since, able to torture from any instrument a musical note, I had to perform for several months the orderly duty of a musician, and thus became familiar with officers and what was transpiring at regimental headquarters. Then for some time I was in charge of collecting and distributing the mail of the regiment, and came in contact and became pretty well acquainted with nearly every officer and a man in it. The life was new to me, and intensely interesting. The events were thrilling. I was young and my mind was susceptible of deep and lasting impressions. Nearly every man in the original company who did not fall in battle, die of wounds or disease, or was not discharged for disability, received a commission. Thus it was decimated or scattered. Soon after my discharge I was practically imprisoned for four years at West Point, and then at once ordered to New Mexico, and until recent years I have served almost continuously beyond the western frontier, 
and have had but little or no opportunity to talk over with comrades the incidents of this battle. Soon after I commenced to read the postbellum accounts of it, I wrote out my own experience and the incidents I recount tonight are taken from that narrative. Since then I have met my three brothers who were in the regiment and battle, and I asked each in turn to give me his version on certain points, and they differed materially in nothing that is in this paper. Now I have no axe to grind here, and I would detract not one iota from the name, fame, or laurels of any man. My experience has been that about all that do their best in battle, and I have no sympathy with fireside military critics after the fact. I took the humble and insignificant part of a private soldier in the great battle, and am content with that honor, but I would like to see a full and correct account of it recorded in history. You know that it is generally understood that our army was completely surprised, and that the advance, or 6th Division, commanded by General Benjamin Prentiss, fled from their beds before the enemy, and most of them were captured. This is entirely incorrect. A few years since I met Colonel R.T. Van Horn, member of the House of Last Congress, and since the war editor-in-chief of the Kansas City Journal of Commerce, I asked him why, as a literary man, he did not write a detailed account of the attack and battle. He said he made his report as commander of the regiment immediately after the battle, and it was on file in Washington. In that city, later I asked Colonel Scott, in charge of the publication of the Rebellion Records, to let me read the report. In a large hand, it covered less than a sheet of paper, written in a sacked camp, when all were tired and exhausted, the numbers of killed, wounded, and missing were not accurately known, and it gave very few details. The regiment was reorganized after being paroled at the Siege of Lexington, and was at Benton Barracks near St. Louis, driving vigorously when the news of the fall of Forts Henry and Donaldson in the Battle of Pea Ridge in rapid succession reached us, creating intense enthusiasm and a burning desire on the part of all to have a hand in the work of war. So favorably begun after the long, weary months of waiting, in fact, discouraging inactivity. Indeed, they were about the first substantial successes of the Union arms. None who lived in the North at the commencement of the war, surrounded by patriotic influences, can understand what the loyal people of the border slave states had to undergo and endure for their loyalty at the hands of secessionists. Our surrender at Lexington after the long and trying siege, though honorable and credible in the eyes of the government and the people, was humiliating to the regiment itself, and it longed not only from hatred caused by persecution, but also from a feeling of revenge to meet the enemy in a more equal contest. So great joy and hilarity ran through the regiment when orders came for it to move, though the men knew not whether. March 26, it was escorted by several regiments and a band to the streets of St. Louis and boarded the steamer Continental. At Cairo, we turned up to Ohio and all began to smell our course and probable destination. A short stop was made at Paducah, and General Prentiss and staff came on board. When we turned up to Tennessee, all knew we were bound for the heart of Dixie's land, and that song, modified to more appropriate words, was a constant refrain. When the recent captured works of Fort Henry built to bar any such invasion hove in sight, a prolonged general shout rent the air. We viewed with much satisfaction the Union soldiers manning the guns as we sped by, and we gave them cheer after cheer. On we plowed up the beautiful river, halting briefly at Savannah, the headquarters of the assembling army, for General Prentiss and our colonel to report to General C.F. Smith. For, be it remembered that the council of war that placed General Grant in command was not held till April 2nd, practically but three days before the battle. Eight miles above, we stopped at Pittsburgh Landing just at dark, March 28th. The 29th we disembarked, and Sunday the 30th, just one week before the battle, the regiment marched past the camps of the other troops towards Corinth, some four miles from the landing, and went into camp perpendicularly to the road. Within three or four days, other regiments arrived, extending the line to the left, forming two brigades of the 6th Division, leaving my regiment on the right, and therefore the first of the 1st Brigade. Our Colonel Peabody commanded this brigade, and my Captain Donnelly was detail, acting Assistant Adjutant General. As our first lieutenant was acting regimental quartermaster temporarily, and the second lieutenant was an inexperienced boy, the captain exercised also supervision of the company and kept it busy in camp instruction even giving it target practice, and it was said he urged that the rifle pits be made and the camp prepared for defense. On Wednesday the 2nd, a part of the regiment was sent out, one and a half or two miles in the direction of Corinth on picket duty. Keeping vigilance that night, I saw the heavens illuminated by the Confederate campfires. We were astounded at the proximity and apparent great numbers of the enemy. Our men visiting the farmhouses nearby were warned that they ran great risk of capture. The Confederate cavalry was scouring the neighborhood. It was thought at first that this was simply said to keep them away, but they were warned in every house. That afternoon, Thursday, we were relieved by another detail, but the men who returned to camp on Friday afternoon reported that no detail had relieved them, and that there was no picket whatever on that road between us and the enemy. If we were not aware of the dense ignorance of all at that time on military matters, particularly of practical soldiering, we could attribute this neglect only to traitor's design. There was considerable cavalry in the command. Why was it not screening our camp? and even feeling the enemy in his own. 
Simply ignorance. We had no generals but in rank and authority. I say this not in disparagement of any who were there, but as a fact. When they learned their business in the only school for generals, the great practical school of war, many of them want to place them in the very greatest generals the world has ever produced. The Grant and Sherman of 1864 would have relieved for utter inefficiency generals of no more skill than the Grant and Sherman at Shiloh. On Saturday afternoon, the whole 6th Division, but the camp guard was reviewed in a field near General Prentice's headquarters, and the rumor afterwards confirmed went through the camp that night that a detachment of Confederate cavalry rode up to the edge of the field and witnessed the review. At retreat, Captain Donnelly, though adjutant of the brigade, came to the company and said that the enemy was marching on the camp in force and was within 14 miles. There would be a battle and he wanted to see a high company ready. He inspected the arms, equipments, and ammunition carefully and gave instruction and advice. We were required to lie. I will not say sleep on our arms. Once came this information, I do not know. There was no secrecy. The whole regiment anticipated a battle. Some of the officers sat up late and others remained up all night. Among the latter was Colonel Peabody, who communicated with General Prentice that evening and expressed his belief that preparations should be made for an energetic defense. So accurate was his information, or correct his conviction, that during the night he ordered the two reliefs of the brigade guard not on post to patrol the front under Major Powell, field officer of the day. This developed a force believed to be the enemy's picket. As a vigilant commander, the colonel, upon getting the information, sent out three companies of the regiment under Powell, B. Captain Joseph Smith, and E. Captain Simon S. Evans the two companies that stormed the hospital building at Lexington. And H. Captain Hamilton Dill, a soldier of the Mexican War. They drove in the enemy's picket and developed his main force about one and a half miles from our camp. The colonel then sent out a part of the 21st Missouri Infantry to reinforce the Major Powell's command, and in the engagement that followed, Colonel Moore lost a leg. At daybreak, wounded were being brought into camp and the companies were formed in their streets, prepared for battle. No orders coming from division headquarters, Colonel Peabody ordered the long roll beaten and the regiment formed in line. The alarm was taken up by regiment after regiment and spread throughout the army. Shortly, General Prentice came riding rapidly down the line to our colonel, jerked up his horse, and with great earnestness, if not great anger, exclaimed, Colonel Peabody, I will hold you personally responsible for bringing on this engagement. The colonel, with severe dignity and illy concealed contempt, answered in his clear, strong voice, General Prentice, I am personally responsible for all my official acts. This stormy interview was seen, if their words were not heard, by hundreds of men, and my brother Marcus, Later, lieutenant of the regiment and captain in the 43rd Missouri Infantry was orderly for the colonel at the time, and both heard and saw what occurred. Each regiment of the brigade moved at once directly to the front to support Colonel Moore and meet the enemy in the advance of our camp. The line was an echelon led by my regiment, which halted between half and three quarters of a mile out, a little in rear, but considerably to the right of Colonel Moore's skirmish line. I will digress to say that the guns of the only battery in the division had not arrived. The personnel and horses were camped on the right of the brigade. Some three-fourths of a mile to the right of this gunless battery was the left of Sherman's division. Its right somewhat advanced. Opposite this interval, to the front but nearer Sherman's left was Shiloh Church, a mere log country meeting house. To resume, the regiment was standing at rest, the skirmishing and the fact that the next regiment came up overlapping our left, causing some confusion, diverted attention in that direction. Looking to the front again, I saw coming down a gentle slope with an easy range the Confederates massed many lines deep. Reflect for one moment upon the profound ignorance of war. Two hostile armies hunting each other without a skirmish line or advance of any kind. Lieutenant Colonel R.T. Van Horn, our regimental commander, gave the commands. Attention battalion, ready, aim, fire! The moving mass was decimated and staggered. Its heavy loss, its very density prevented a vigorous reply. A heavy fire was poured upon them in their deployment, but soon our men commenced to fall thick and fast. Then we sought the shelter of the trees, for we were in heavy oak timber pretty free from underbrush. This position was held until our unsupported right and left were being turned, when we fell back from tree to tree to avert being enveloped. Every step was stubbornly disputed. Our men were mostly hunters who would have scorned a shooting a squirrel or wild turkey but through the head, and were cool. The Johnnies yelled vociferously, Bull run, bull run, and our men shouted back defiance. Why don't you come on? Indeed, the withering fire they received at first made them cherry oppressing us, and we could hear and see the efforts of their officers urging them on. These were among the first casualties on the field, and doubtlessly the wounded and many of the killed were carried off, but the number of dead found here after the battle was appalling. Thus we resisted the advance of the enemy until our color line was reached. With all that was at stake before now, we had our camp to defend. Here we had our daily dress parades and pomp of war. Now had come the circumstance. Colonel Peabody, always electrifying, was doubly so now. We were not whipped, but simply outnumbered. With a look of mortified pride but great determination on his handsome face, he conjured the men to hold their ground, 
Pointing to the words in golden letters on our flag, he cried out, Lexington men. Lexington, remember Lexington. How long we held the enemy at bay at this line, I cannot say. It is beyond the range of human skill to estimate accurately the flight of time in battle. Behind trees in the company streets and simply tents that screened us from sight, we kept up a constant fire. The enemy could not dislodge us. He dared not charge over the comparatively open ground between us. And for the same reason as well as because of our disorganized condition and his vastly superior numbers, we could not charge him. But we held him at musket range and expected momentarily support. We thought we had him permanently checked and would soon drive him back. Since the battle was on, the entire army could have assembled on our line had it followed the simple maxim of war. In the absence of orders, marched the sound of battle. And we longed for field guns that started him back and lamented they did not come. There was a perceptible lull in the roar of musketry at the left, and my attention was diverted from the front by a rifle ball striking a tree and filling the right side of my neck with small pieces of oak bark. Stung by the sharp pain and enthused by seeing a dun horse battery coming from the left at full run, I exclaimed, We will give them hell now, a battery's coming. My brother William had hardly finished chiding me for using such language when it whirled in the battery about 200 yards away and opened upon us with a grape and canister. Horror of horrors, even ahead of the deafening reports of the gun came a storm of missiles screaming and shrieking through the air, ripping through tents, smashing tent poles, knocking from the trees, limbs that rained upon us, tearing up the ground and raising a blinding dust. Crash, crash, came in rapid succession the showers of iron hail. A solid shot plunged through a tree and a shell burst in a mud-baked oven and covered us with a cloud of dust and beat us with clods and splinters. We couldn't help it. We had to let go. Could these be the guns whose reports carried the first tidings of the Battle of Grant at the breakfast table at Savannah, 12 miles away? Just in the rear of the line of field officers' tents, a knot of us made another stand. Here Colonel Peabody's horse passed us, riderless and stirrups flapping in the air. We knew our brave and noble colonel had fallen. His body was found nearby after the battle, and subsequently it was sent to Springfield, Massachusetts. In the cemetery there, a monument draped with his country's flag bearing the words Lexington Shiloh, 25th Missouri Volunteer Infantry, all cut in marble marks his grave, the grave of the hero of Shiloh. The man whose devotion cost him his life, whose vigilance, energy, and bravery saved the army from utter surprise and defeat, and the Union cause from all the far-reaching consequences. Probably no man of our armies in our entire history rendered his country at one time more valuable service. And yet outside the few survivors of his regiment, his name is hardly known and is unhonored and unsung. Here this paper should properly end for its main object is to give some of the circumstances attending the attack and shoving back of the 6th Division. As I desire to make a few comments on, I will not say criticize the battle, and as my story proper is not long, I will continue to presume upon your patience. Our little party was soon approached by Captain Donnelly, the brigade adjutant, who demanded with some asperity to know why we had not obeyed the order to retire directed us to do so and pointed to the rear towards Hurlbut's division, as where our division was forming. We had simply heard no orders. We soon came to an open field, and as both flanks had been turned, to turn to the right or left meant certain death or capture. We must cross the open ground. A few rods out, and a whiz, 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 the bullets cut the air. Zip, 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 they ricocheted by our sides to the front. None hit me, but they excited wonderfully my power of propulsion, and I believe my fortune would be assured as a sprinter now if I could only find some equally effective promoter or locomotion. Behind a high rail fence, on low ground and dense underbrush, we found the remnants of the regiment and brigade assembled in line. Soon a terrific artillery duel commenced from the enemy trying to shell us from the position, and we were supporting a 20-pounder battery always referred to by the men as the Black Gun Battery, probably Wilkers of the 1st Missouri. Its manipulation and maneuvering were truly marvelous, and brought forth time and again cheers that sounded above the roar of battle. As a battery deployed by platoon section or pieces, it would deliver fire, and the limbers drawn by eight strong horses would seem to bound to the rear, cannoneers spring to their places and fly away at breakneck speed, regardless of trees, logs, or other obstacles to a new position. Hardly would they leave the firing point when a grist of shot or shell would come screaming through the air to find them gone. These projectiles usually went high, playing havoc with limbs and treetops that showered upon us once completely enveloping a number of men who crawl from under amidst the latter of all near. I saw one of the enemy's guns end up and keel over, another confusion caused by our guns. Meanwhile, we had changed position several times, the enemy unseen in mass and an enormous force close by. We occupied for a time a sunken road that traversed a ridge, but finally moved straight to the front in line, the center and the dim road, Major Powell commanding in advance of the colors, but walking backwards. We were soon upon the enemy, formed in such close order as to appear simply a vast multitude. Note again, no skirmishers in advance. 
The Major, turning to the front, saw the enemy and realizing the critical situation, waved his sword and commanded, To the rear, march! Falling as did also the color bearer from the volley we received. Sergeant Simmons rushed out and grabbed the flag, and four or five of us dragged Major Powell away. A few hundred yards to the rear, we put him in an ambulance. He then joined us to the return to the firing line and do our best that every man was needed. He was shot in the side and died that night, patriotic, cool, and brave to the last. We found the firing line in the sunken road mentioned, which was about 15 inches or more deep, affording excellent cover and good rest while firing. For a short distance to the front, there was an undergrowth of hickory and oak not yet leaped out, so we could see and aim through it. But so dense as to conceal our line at a few yards. We held this position for hours, pouring a deadly fire upon the enemy and repulsing every attempt to dislodge us. The underbrush became wooded stubble, gnawed off by bullets. The roadbed after the battle had a carpet of paper from the cartridges we'd bitten off. At the front, one could walk on the enemy's dead for acres. This is literally true. And a large portion of the ground bore charred remains from a fire that had swept over it. Before the position was taken and many of the line captured, my ammunition being about exhausted, I found there was not in sight a face I knew. A feeling came over me I cannot describe, and dread that if I were killed, no one would know what had become of me, not even my brothers or parents. I deliberately walked away. A few rods to the rear, I saw the first evidence of general supervision in the battle. A wagon load of ammunition piled by the roadside, but none of it fitted my musket. Soon I met my brother, John N., also hunting the regiment, which we found a little farther on, and lying across the road. It was now nearly sunset. To show in part the desperate fighting the enemy experienced in carrying the sunken road, I will give a few ex extracts from the account written by Preston Johnson, son and aide-de-camp to the Confederate commanding general who lost his life in the last charge. When the Confederate army reached Hurlbut's division and that of W.H.L. Walsh's, with a fragment of apprentices, a gigantic contest began. Hurlbut's men were amassed in a position so impregnable and thronged with such fierce defenders that it won from the Confederates the title of the Hornet's Nest. Here behind a dense thicket at the crest of a hill was a posting, was posted a strong force of hardy troops as ever fought. For five hours, a brigade and brigade was led against it. Hyman's brigades, which earlier in the day had swept everything before them, were now reduced to fragments and paralyzed for the rest of the day. A.P. Stewart's regiments made fruitless assaults. Gibson's brigade was ordered by Bragg to the assault and made a gallant charge, but like the others, recoiled and fell back with very heavy loss. Bragg ordered them again to the charge, and again they suffered a bloody repulse. This bloody affray lasted till nearly 4 o'clock p.m. without making any visible impression upon the federal center. When General Johnson came up and saw the situation, he said to his staff, They're offering several resistance here. I shot to put the bayonets to them. His hat was off. His presence was inspiring as he sat on his thoroughbred bay. His voice was persuasive, his words were few. He said, Men, they are stubborn. We must use the bayonet. When he reached the center of the line, he turned and said, I will lead you and move toward the federal lines. With a mighty shout, the line moved forward at a charge. A sheet of flame and a mighty roar burst from the Federal stronghold. The Confederate line withered, but there was not an instant's pause. The crest was gained. General Johnson had his horse shot in four places, his clothing was pierced with bullets, and his boot sole was cut by a mini-ball. The Federal soldiers kept up a continuous fire as they fell back on their reserves and delivered volley after volley as they sullenly retired. A mini-ball from one of these did its fatal work. As he sat there after his wound, Governor Harris returned and finding him very pale asked him, General, are you wounded? He answered in a very deliberate and emphatic tone, Yes, I, and I fear seriously. These were his last words. Without dark, the head of Buell's army, led by a brass band playing merrily patriotic airs, marched upon this field of carnage. This made a deep impression upon all. After dark, our shattered battalion was marched for rations inside the entrenchment constructed by Colonel Webster, and then marched out again. We had had nothing to eat all day. Though exhausted from fatigue, rain, and the firing of the gunboats at short intervals all night, made sleep without shelter or blankets impossible. At dawn we were in the midst of the slain and learned for the first time how far the enemy had turned our left, how near he had approached the landing, and how desperate and bloody had been the contest near our base. Many of us sat upon dead horses while we ate our breakfast of hard bread and raw bacon. Near us were six Confederate dead, killed by a seal cannonball that had plunged through a tree. The army had been assembled during the night, but there was some delay in adjusting the lines. From the beginning of the battle to the finish, there was an incessant booming of artillery and simply a constant roar of musketry that varied only in intensity, and our army made continuous progress. During the first part of the day, my regiment was in the second line, which was more trying than we had ever found the first. The contest was very severe, about 11 o'clock, and we were hugging the ground closely, bullets cutting the brush just over us, and when an officer, whose coolness and bravery excited our admiration, rode up and spoke to some of the officers. My brother William, then a sergeant, came to me and handing me his canteen said, Go back to the ravine and fill this in your own, 
and don't you come back without water. I found no water directly in the rear and had to follow the ravine a long distance. When I returned, the regiment was gone. I simply wandered and followed the lines, making fruitless inquiries till our sacked and plundered camp was reached late in the afternoon. In 1889, 27 years after the battle, my brother explained to me for the first time that he overheard the officer ask what regiment it was and say the reply it was just the one he wanted, that he wanted to drive the enemy from a certain position, etc. Not believing I would live through the rush, said my brother, nor seeing how anyone could, I thought I would try to save you. What followed this order, though interesting, is no part of his paper. Our regimental quartermaster was in arrest for having secured in his zeal another complete uniform for the regiment, under the misunderstanding that it had none. The enormous pile of boxes here in the field have been emptied by our friends, the enemy. Old shoes covered the ground for a radius of a hundred yards. Not a blanket or stitch of clothing was left in our tents. I then and there formed the resolution to wear thereafter my best clothes in battle. The vigilance of Colonel Peabody saved the Union Army from utter surprise. He was inspired, no doubt, by his energetic adjutant, Captain Donnelly, and guided by him and Major Powell, both men of military experience. Peabody and Donnelly, like all my regiment, having lived in a slave state, and served in one nearly a year, understood the spirit, energy, enterprise, and terrible earnestness of the secessionist. When our government resorted to war to save the Union, the South knew that failure meant the death knell of slavery. The proud, spirited, fiery, warlike people, they threw their whole souls into the contest and were willing to sacrifice their property and, if need be, their lives. The fall of Forts Henry and Donaldson and the concentration of an army at Pittsburgh Landing was turning the impregnable position of Columbus, the Gibraltar of America, that blocked the Mississippi. It was a wedge splitting in twain the Confederacy and lopping off the great source of supplies of its armies and people. It caused the greatest consternation and alarm and called for a spontaneous and unanimous effort of the people to hurl the invaders back, or all would be lost. A proclamation was issued to governors of states who in turn made passionate appeals to the people, who bent every effort in response. The invading army should be met before strengthened by the arrival of Buell. Military organizations of whatever name or nature rushed to the rescue, some of their governors accompanying them, to urge them on to victory. The Confederate generals were overwhelmed and could not handle and organize the hordes that came pouring in and delayed the start. On the other hand, our army was only a rapidly concentrated, badly organized aggregation of armed raw material. The battles of Forts Henry and Donaldson had been won more by superb fighting qualities than from generalship or military skill. The necessity to place General Grant in command on the eve of battle was swapping horses in the middle of the stream and gave him no time to compass the situation. The almost absolute necessity that no battle should be fought before the arrival of Buell's army seemed to forbid scouting or anything that might appear aggressive. Ignorance of the resources, energy, and enterprise of the enemy lulled our commanders into fancy security. Uh, the day before the battle, the day the enemy arrived within two and a half miles of camp and delayed attack till morning only to have more daylight, General Grant sent this official report. I have scarcely the faintest idea of an attack, General One, being made upon us, but will be repaired should such a thing take place. The regiments to compose this army had not all arrived. Prentice's 3rd Brigade was still in the steamers. Divisions were not camped within supporting distance, and there were wide gaps in the same line. Our left, due in part to the non-arrival of Prentice's other brigade, was too far from the river and unsupported. Indeed, it was never expected that the battle would be fought at Shiloh. The concentration of troops had been so rapid that officers were entirely unacquainted and did not know what regiments were to the right or left. Many regiments wore uniforms furnished by their state, and some of them were mistaken in the battle for the enemy, and vice versa. There was a great variety of small arms and artillery, and troops became paralyzed from one of proper ammunition alone, and some regiments had never loaded their arms for the battle. In fact, there had been no proper training, and there was no system. The only soldierly quality present was a desire to fight. The battle was simply a series of fierce combats. So many brigade and regimental commanders fell, and their successors knew so little as to what orders had been received, or whence they came, that the reports simply defy a tangible connection for an accurate account of the struggle. The Confederate Army, with its great bulk in the front, struck our short lines and enveloped them, so they had to give way or be captured. But they would not yield a step without determined resistance. They would then fall back upon fresh troops or take a strong position and repulse assault after assault, and the ground was particularly favorable for such fighting. The enemy fought to conquer or to fall, and they fell by thousands. As the strength of the Confederate forces will never be known from their very conglomeration, and lack of returns, so too will never be known the number of their countless dead upon that sanguinary field. The number must have been largely in excess of our own, which God knows was horrible enough. Companions, no people can be true to themselves who send untrained the flower of their youth to such wanton slaughter. Had our government maintained at moderate expense a reasonably sized army, it could have reinforced promptly the garrison of Fort Sumter and other points and nipped the rebellion in the bud. Our political questions would have been settled without bloodshed, and thousands of millions of treasure and half a million of lives would have been saved. 
and incalculable suffering and misery averted. None like the old soldier knows the real costs and horrors of war. Then let us, a band of old soldiers and patriots devoted to our country, keep impressed upon the people that if we would avert the costs and horrors of war, we simply have to be always prepared for one.